Good morning. morning. Happy spring. <laughs> it definitely feels a lot different out there today. A lot milder and all the snow is gone. So but I was looking at the forecast. It looks like there's snow on the way, so maybe we'll have a white Christmas. But it feels a little cooler in here. I think it's colder in here than it is outside. I said if it wasn't COVID, I'd say you could get closer to your neighbors and warm up. But we know we can't do that. So. So welcome to our service of worship today. Welcome to those who are joining us online on our tablet ministry. And welcome to Jamie who's running around in the background of our video now. <laughs> Turning on the lights. It's great. Uh, a few announcements before we start. Uh, we recognize that we're worshiping on the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Now, as always, uh, masks need to be worn when you're coming in and out. But if you feel comfortable, you may take them off during the service. Uh, Christian Council Carol Singh is tomorrow. I apologize, I sent out some wrong information on the email there, but it is tomorrow evening at the Skirman uh, Gazebo, 7 to 7.30. Uh, so come on out and sing. And it's supposed to be nice weather, so we won't have to do any delays or anything like that. So. Uh, Carol, Singel, Carol Singers Wanted. So this year, uh, we're allowed to have a, a small choir for our uh, Clinton View service and uh, Kensington Community Care. And normally when I do services in December, we usually do a bit of a service with a lot of singing. So if you'd like to come out and uh, lend your voices to this cause, please do. Uh, this, this Thursday, 2.30 at Clinton View. And then Friday, I have the Community Care service at 1.30. Uh, if you're interested, all you need to do, you need to bring your Vax Pass and you need to bring a mask. So um, if you're interested, please come out to either or both of those services. That'd be great. Otherwise, they're gonna be stuck with me singing like they do always. Uh, Christmas collections, we're continuing to uh, seek collections uh, for non-perishable food items and uh, toys and more money uh, for the Lions Club or the Tree of Hope. The Comfort and Hope service is uh, the longest night, which is December 21st. It'll be at Kensington Church at seven o'clock. So if you don't feel like you're in a celebrating mood this Christmas season, or you feel like you just want to come out and support someone, or you just enjoy that kind of service, please feel free. Christmas Eve services, as you most of you are probably aware, because of our numbers, we can't do our joint service at Christmas. So we're having two services, 6.30 at Kensington, 7.30 here at St. John's. So whatever time works best for you. And uh, just note that we're having masks on during those services, throughout the services, just as a way of keeping people feeling a little more safe because we know we have people coming that aren't normally worshiping with us necessarily on Sunday mornings. Uh, the Pastoral Charge Joint Board Session meeting is tomorrow. Just note the change of time just to uh, take into account the carol sing from 7 to 7.30. We're going to be having it at 7.45 at Kensington. So if you can come out and sing and then we'll move to the church and have the meeting or you can just come to the meeting afterwards. Uh, we're continuing to collect toilet paper for the uh, Gifts from the Heart Incorporated. And I see there's a bunch back there, so thank you to those who have brought it. And if anyone else would like to continue to bring that, that's great. And we'll make sure it gets to them. And uh, throughout Advent, we've been doing our Advent Wise Men Adventures. And people have been sending me pictures of what their wise men are doing on their journeys. So uh, if you'd like to take part, feel free to do that. Just take a picture of your uh, nativity scene, your wise men, and put them around the house, and you can send them to me. You can text them or email them to me, and let's share some of our adventures we've got so far this week. So we have more, our journey of our wise men. We have uh, Barry sent these, uh, Among Heavenly Company. So there they are, up with the angels. I love it. Uh, Juliana sent these. We have Walking Away from the Horizon, and we have some other ones getting instructions from the angel there. We have these are from my house. Uh, Caroline sent these in. They're checking out the temperature of the house. Yeah. Uh, Anne sent these uh, in a bedroom window. Hey, who are these guys up there? I thought there were supposed to be three wise men. You can see there's more than three there. What a great view. And then Judy sent me this along with a story. So I have. They've traveled far over desert and plain. These wise star watchers know the star from east is something extraordinary, and they're drawn to follow it. They've heard the stories of a new king coming to save Israel, and they must, and they must want to be a part of this amazing event. See how they carefully they handle those precious gifts, gifts they will give in worship to the new king. And I think this is last but not least, this is uh, Nanette sent these in, so a couple different sets. 
in different places. So there you go, we've got our journey of our wise men, so feel free to continue to take part in that if you'd like to. So let us come together, let us join and worship as we sing our introit, Hope is a Star, and as we're hitting the third week in Advent, we'll have three verses ending with joy. to those who are broken in body and spirit, and you draw close to those who walk alone. Through your great love and mercy, you transform all of us into more than we ever thought we could be. Lord, we will trust in you and not be afraid. With joy, we sing of your glory and proclaim your saving power. Almighty God, receive our prayers and praise this day, for you alone are worthy. All-knowing God, we know perfect joy only comes through faith in you. Yet we seek it out in lesser ways. In search of comfort, we indulge in our passions and desires. In search of love, we hide from our faults and put up fronts. 
Forgive us, O God, for seeking satisfaction in the wrong places. Help us turn again to you, our true source of joy, and guide us to discover what is honorable, just, and pleasing in your sight. All this we pray, saying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Friends, the scriptures tell us, Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The forgiveness we seek is ours through the grace of Jesus Christ. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding be with each and every one of you. Amen. Our seasonal song today is uh, Mary's Boy Child. Some of you might know this song. It's not necessarily a, a church hymn, but uh, the message in it is still good. Hopefully they'll get the timing right. Well. I usually get it right in practice. It wasn't going to us through the scriptures that we read and that are interpreted today. Open our eyes to understand your truth more fully and our hearts to live out your wisdom in the example of Jesus, who is your living word. Amen. The response of reading uh, is taken from the book of Isaiah. It's chapter 2 and we're reading verses 2 through to 6. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the nations, proclaim that his name is exalted. Shout aloud and sing for joy, 
O royal Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Our Gospel reading today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, and we're reading 17 through to 18, or 7 through 18. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And what, would you sh and what should we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah. And John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into this granary. But the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. This is the word of the Lord. Parents, grandparents, babysitters, teachers, really anyone who's spent time looking after children have probably heard the question, what should we do? More often than we could probably count. Like on those rainy days when playing outside isn't really an option and kids don't know how to pass the time. Or when they finish their assignment and there's still time left in class and they're unsure of what to do next. Maybe they've entertained themselves for a while but they've grown bored so they come seeking advice. The funny thing is there's often lots of options available to them. They probably have a plethora of toys lying around. At school, they could have other schoolwork to finish, yet they either don't put much thought into what they could do, or they'd rather someone else entertain them, or at least have someone else come up with some ideas. As we get older, it seems we have the exact opposite problem. For many of us, the question, what should we do, isn't about being bored or looking for things to accomplish. Instead, it's more of looking at prioritizing our jobs and our tasks. And this is because too often we find ourselves running out of time to get things done, or we have more items on our list than we have hours in the day. Instead of being bored, we find ourselves wishing we had some downtime that we could relax. It's often only when we're older still and unable to do as much as we once did that we might find ourselves again wondering, what should we do in terms of filling our days? Therefore, regardless of our age, regardless of our context, this question of what should we do seems to be central to our lives. So we shouldn't be surprised that in the ancient world, people of all walks of life found themselves asking that exact same question. However, unlike the scenarios that I've outlined, the people from our biblical readings aren't asking the question, what should we do, as a means of breaking boredom or figuring out what they should do next from their seemingly endless list of tasks. Instead, they're inquiring about what they need to do to live out their lives, as John the Baptist tells them. The beginning of our scripture reading isn't exactly heartwarming or encouraging. John's words hardly seem inviting to those who've come out to be baptized by him. In fact, John's words sound harsh as he chastises those who are in the audience. But he's not here to make friends. He's, he knows that his job isn't to sugarcoat things. Instead, as a prophet sent by God, John challenges those who've come to hear him and to be baptized. 
He warns them that there are consequences to the lives that they're living and the paths that they've chosen. Therefore, therefore, his scolding isn't about belittling those in the crowd. Instead, he's calling on them to re-examine their lives. He's calling on them to reprioritize, to turn back to lives that are centered and that are focused on God. John's opening salvo begins, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. John's reference to the vipers or snakes gives us a hint to how the people are living. If we look back to the Garden of Eden and the snake who tempts Eve, we understand that the people are living their lives apart from God. They're living lives contrary to how God wants them to live. Just as Satan deceived Adam and Eve, these people have deceived themselves into thinking that their lives are good and that they can live as they please and that they don't necessarily need God. They convince themselves that there are no consequences for their actions and that their desires, their wants, their needs are all that really matter. John's reference to the children of Abraham also tells us that there were those in the crowd who thought that they were entitled or they could always fall back on the fact that they were descendants of and therefore heirs to God's promise to Abraham. Meaning they believed their heritage gave them favor and it gave them privilege, perhaps even some leniency. But John is quick to point out that their lineage isn't enough. They must be cautious about abusing their ancestral history. In other words, as children of God, they have responsibilities and God has expectations of them. What are these expectations? To bear fruit. John uses the image of fruit trees to explain how the crowd is to live their lives. They're to bear good fruit in the world. Otherwise, John warns, there's an axe ready and waiting to chop down the unproductive trees. Again, this is a harsh reality. But the prophet's cautioning the people around him that, there aren't, that they aren't to live fruitless or wasteful lives as children of God. Otherwise, they might as well be firewood. Because a tree that doesn't bear good fruit doesn't serve a purpose and is therefore only good for the fire. Sufficiently reprimanded or at least willing to concede that John has a point, the crowd gathered in the wilderness asks the prophet, what then should we do? They want to know how they can change. They want to know what they must do to live as God wants them to. John answers them saying, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And what should we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. In his response, John the Baptist gives his audience a list of practical things that they can do. Not for themselves, but for God and others. He tells them to look out for those around them, especially those in need, by giving food to the hungry and clothes to those who are without. John also gives more ideas of how to live as he calls out some of the audience specifically. He points a finger at the tax collectors and he tells them to be honest in their work and not to cheat their neighbors. Next, John casts his attention on the soldiers who were in the crowd and he tells them not to coerce or to squeeze people for money in any circumstance, nor are they to abuse their power or their position. Instead, they're to perform their job satisfied with what they earn. Besides these practical rules and guidelines, we can also infer from his message that we're not to give in to greed or our desires for wealth and possessions. This is especially true when it comes to the expense of others. Ultimately, John tells those in the crowd that they're to live selflessly and to turn their eyes to God's will. Like I spoke about last Sunday, 
God's calling on the people to be baptized with water and to repent. He's challenging them to willingly repent of their old ways, meaning to turn their lives around, to freely change their minds, to reorient themselves, to live new lives in God's name. The prophet argues that they need to reprioritize their lives to produce good fruit as they seek to share the love of God and the love of their neighbors. John's words were challenging for those in the desert, and they continue to challenge us today. Like those in the wilderness seeking John and his promise of baptism, we too find ourselves seeking Jesus and all that he brings. But in doing so, we discover that the focus of our lives is often wrong. Inadvertently, or perhaps consciously, we may find that we're living for ourselves. We strive for what we want or desire, and we forget or don't notice those around us who are in need. Perhaps in our effort to live our lives to get or to get what we want, we step on others or we push them aside because they're in our way. Maybe it's not so subtle. Maybe we're just too comfortable in our lives, like those who thought they could relax because they were ancestors of Abraham. Perhaps as followers of Christ, we too rely on our position as a form of comfort and relief. Maybe we make excuses for not living as we should, banking on the notion of God's grace and forgiveness. But we too need to heed John's message. We can't live as disciples of Christ only in name alone. We can't live as our Savior wants if we live only in the past and what we've done in his name before. This just doesn't work. We can't live off the past, what others have done or even what we've done. When we do so, we're nothing more than fruit trees that bear no fruit. We're not contributing to the kingdom of God. Therefore, we need to heed John's warning and to focus on the love of God and to love our neighbors. We need to live right and to help those in need. We need to bear good fruit by being fair, by being just, by treating others with love and respect, by giving to those who are lacking. We need to look past ourselves and to stop being complacent or relying on what was. We need to reorient ourselves to live a life Jesus calls us to live. During this Advent and Christmas season, we often find ourselves in a giving mood. This is the time of year that people feel most generous, giving to food banks and toy drives and other charities. This is wonderful because there are a lot of people in need. However, we must remember that this isn't the only time where we're called to give or to look out for others. As disciples of Christ, we're called to give of ourselves. We're called to share God's love to our neighbors all year long. This isn't always easy and we don't always know how this looks. We might have our own financial constraints. We may not be able to get around and do as much as we used to. Maybe we struggle to find the time. Perhaps we just don't know the most urgent needs. Overwhelmed or uncertain like those in the crowd listening to John, we too might find ourselves asking, what should we do? The answer, to produce good fruit in Jesus' name. If we seek to do this, then we know we're on the right track that we're living as both John and our Savior proclaim. So let us call upon Jesus. Let us repent. Let us follow his calling. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, what should we do? What do you call us to do with our lives? How do we make sure that we're trees that bear good fruit instead of living off the past or what we've done before? Savior, through the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask that you'd open our eyes to see how we can show our love to you and to our neighbors. Open our ears to hear of those who need a helping hand or words of encouragement. Lead us into situations where we can help those in need with willing hands. May we look past our own desires as we bear good fruit in your name. Amen. This week, as we reflect on uh, what we've read and heard, I ask you to prayerfully consider what our Lord is calling you to do. And in what ways is Jesus calling me to bear good fruit?
Fittingly, today, as we celebrate the joy in the Advent, we make our offering today with joyful hearts, anticipating our celebration of God's gift to us through Jesus Christ. Friends, know that your gifts may touch lives in deep need this season with the joy that we have received in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Joyful God, we bring our gifts with hearts that rejoice in your goodness to us. Lord, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to bless our gifts and us with the power to shine the light of Christ in the lives where only Jesus can turn despair into joy. We ask all this in his holy name. Amen. Let's join together in singing, People Look East. Thanksgiving as the beauty of the season unfolds with starry nights, Christmas lights, and we used to have sparkling snow. We thank you for smiling faces and generosity that grows around us despite the continuing struggles and discouragement surrounding this pandemic. Lord, with the kindness of your spirit, awaken opportunities for understanding to emerge among those who are at odds. Refresh our community and congregation with joyful anticipation that only the gift of Christ can bring. Generous God, send joy to the world again. Tender God, we delight in the joy that you bring into our lives and neighborhoods through our life together in Christ and through the love of family and friends. These gifts have sustained us through stressful times, and we thank you. We pray for those who are finding it hard to be joyful this year, remembering those who are facing illness in spirit, mind, or body, and those waiting for a diagnosis or treatment as their anxiety grows. We lift up those who are recovering and healing, for those who are enduring chronic pain or conditions, those who are discouraged by ailing health and loss of freedom. Remind us, Lord, of your healing powers. Generous God, to enjoy to the world again. Loving God, we pray for those who are lonely or in mourning, for those who grieve the loss of loved ones, especially as we come into the holiday season, where their lack of presence will be deeply felt. We pray for those who are hurting, 
We pray for all who have been touched by tragedy and violence, those whose relationships have failed, and those who feel trapped and living in terrible conditions. May the work to help may we work to help those in need. Generous God, is enjoy to the world again. Almighty, we pray for those searching for work, struggling with rising costs, and those worried deeply about their security. As the weather gets colder and colder, we especially think of those living in squalor, those living without shelter, or the inability to pay for hydro or heat. We pray for families that are struggling to put food on their tables or buy clothes for their children. Lord, remind us to be generous and to bear your fruit. Generous God, send joy to the world again. Heavenly Father, we pray for those working to bring justice to the discouraged and defeated, for those seeking peace in places of conflict, for those fighting for the rights of individuals regardless of their status, gender, politics, religion, or other defining factors. We pray for refugees and those who have been driven from their homes, for those seeking shelter in foreign countries, for those who are living in droughts and places of natural disasters. Lord, open our eyes to the ways in which we can help. Generous God, send joy to the world again. In Christ Jesus, there are so many things on our hearts and minds we want to pray for. So in this silence, we lift them up to you. Generous God, send joy to the world again. Amen. Our closing hymn today is Angels We Have Heard on High.
Go with courage and faith, knowing that you are not alone. For you go with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore.